Hello everyone, hope you're doing well. Today in War Thunder it's time to have a look at the stuff that was passed to the developers in March of 2019. And as always, thank you to Coke Spray and the other moderators who have put together this list. And also, why is it important to have a look at the past the developers stuff? Well, there has been stuff in the past which has been passed and uh, has been implemented in the game. The most uh, obvious or recent one, I suppose, which comes to mind is the JU-288, which was passed a few months before it actually got implemented into the game. So see this as not really a sneak peek into what is coming in the future, but definitely a way for me to at least show you the history behind a lot of this stuff, and also on top of it, for you to get an idea of what the developers are looking for. So in this video, we're going to have a look at the aviation side of things, in the next video, the ground forces side of things and then the last video the miscellaneous uh, the maps and mechanics side of things so let's get started with the first vehicle the first vehicle is this the martin p6m seamaster and the seamaster is a naval jet hydro bomber uh, which was built in the 1950s and unfortunately it lost out to the b-52 strato fortress uh, because of some unfortunate well not really designed decisions but basically because of uh, what it wanted to uh, or what it wasn't able to carry in the Stratofortis was so one of the uh, key designs that you can see uh, from this aircraft is the turbo uh, jets which we actually see on the top of it uh, the turbo jets themselves there are four of them uh, Pair, in pairs, you know, two on each of the wings, and you can see them mounted where they are, so they stay away from the spray of the water as this machine is taking off. There is also the tail in the T-shape at the top, which also makes it look like an absolutely stunning plane. You can see it's very thin in the center, and this was built for speed. It was also built to be able to carry a bunch of different bomb loads, but the issue that it had is uh, it was pretty much in competition, or at least seen as in competition with the Air Force's B-52 Strato Fortress at the time, and the Strato Fortress was able to um, deliver nuclear weapons, whereas this was seen as unreliable to do so. And in the 1950s, when that part of warfare was becoming ever more prominent, therefore the Seamaster never really took off. Now, they built about 12 of these uh, from 1955 to 1950. And um, it is definitely an interesting design, which I would love to see in the game. Uh, on top of all of this, uh, the guns that were found on this aircraft is uh, there are no guns looking forward on it, so, so uh, it has no offensive armament in that way, but it does have two 20 millimeters which are looking out of the tail. On top of this, it does have a bunch of different bomb loads. So the first one is 4,000 pounds worth of internal ordnance, whether it's mines, cameras, nuclear, or conventional bombs and depth charges, all stored in a revolving water airtight bomb bay door, very much similar to the B-57B that we have in game, which is, if you've never seen the bomb bay door open on the B-57B, and if you're able to, please go and have a look, uh, because it's definitely a really interesting you know, thing to uh, thing to look at, and then it has options uh, for six or eight machine guns, which could be equipped in the nose. So even though it doesn't have any standard primary armament built into it, you could, in effect, have 50 cals coming out of it, just like the uh, B57 that we also have in game. On top of this as well, it has variations of different bomb loads. You could have two uh, 3,500 pound bombs, so 7 pounds and uh, 7,000 pounds in total, or one 1,800 pound bomb. Then you have a bunch of mine choices, which will become more and more prevalent as naval becomes uh, more of a larger game mode. We've already seen mine layers uh, be tested in War Thunder, and I'm sure when it comes to us, planes will also be able to drop them. Then it has some reconnaissance stuff as well, which definitely isn't as uh, pr as uh, prominent right now in War Thunder, but, you know, could become one of a new large mechanics, especially since we have scouting and ground. Why not have some kind of scouting feature in air, which isn't uh, radar focused, which is actually focused on something else. But uh, it doesn't have any hard points, uh, so unfortunate for this aircraft, and at the end of the day, 
it just became crazy expensive and unfortunately the things that it needed to do uh, were kind of unreliable in uh, we're talking about 400 million dollars 3.5 billion dollars in 2016 dollars and obviously this could not be justified for an aircraft which could not fill out all of the commitments that uh, was wanted and also because you had a brother uh, the b-52 which could but that doesn't mean that in War Thunder it can't shine, and I'll be very much looking forward to this aircraft if it ever gets in. The next one is a cool one. Uh, so, the HFAR. Uh, do you know the HFAR? I'm sure all of you do. And uh, with the HFAR, the HFAR got changed a while back, a very long time ago now, and it was made, uh, in quotations, more realistic. And uh, basically what they did was, uh, back in the day, with ground vehicles against HVARs, and HVARs are found on a lot of American vehicles and also some other vehicles, and what you find with them is back before the rocket changes, the realistic rock or the historical rocket changes, they were one-shotting tanks uh, because they were setting off ammunition, they were being able to annihilate engines or kill crews, and with this um, rocket, you know, realism patch, let's call it, uh, what they were able to do is reduce the penetration of the HVARs. And what is interesting is there are two types of HVARs. There is the, let's call it World War II HVAR, which was used mainly in 1944 and 1945. Uh, it was first uh, used in a large way on D-Day, actually, in Normandy. And the other one, uh, which is more of a heat warhead, uh, was used in the 1950s, and it was also called a HVAR. So, uh, even though we have this HFAR in game, uh, which doesn't have a lot of penetration, which it shouldn't because it's just a full HE filler, you know, there's no <coughs> heat uh, warhead on it or anything like that. There is also this other one, which would be lovely to see in the form of the Mark 32. And as you can see, as it turns out, there were actually two mass-produced versions of the American HVAR. The first version, the one we have in-game right now, is the HVAR Mark VI, which had a HE-based warhead of 3.4 kilograms of, of TNT. And then the other mass-produced and widely used version of the HVAR had the same ballistics, but instead of the HE, it utilized the Mark 25 warhead, which was a heat-based warhead. So, hopefully in the future, what we'll be able to see is uh, the HVAR Mark, uh, Mark 25, which would be uh, a heat warhead uh, HVAR, which would make it a hell of a lot more useful, and I believe it would pen uh, around about 80 to 90 millimeters, uh, and even here, they talk about the HVAR Mark 32 having 263 millimeters of RHA concrete penetration unknown. We may have to have a look at a few uh, statistics on that. I feel like that's a little bit high, but if it's, uh, if it is that high, then this could be a large increase uh, of damage to a lot of those, uh, you know, jet combat uh, machines, which we see at the top of the uh, we see at the top of the American naval tree you can see here that uh, these were from the technical manuals in the 1950s this one was from 1966 uh, so we're not talking about a World War II rocket here so this would only really benefit the top tiers uh, of the American tree and other trees but still it would be lovely to see uh, an extra secondary weapon uh, added to the game since a lot of secondary weapons have been added in recent times and we've got a new you we've got a bunch of new styles of bombs and things like that so why not get a HVAR which would be more useful the next uh, vehicle on our list is the HE-162A8 Volksjäger, uh, which is just a HE-162 with a slightly better engine. Uh, the A2 uh, uses the UMO 004D engine, and uh, sorry, sorry, the A8 uses the UMO 004D engine, whereas the A2 used the BMW 003 engine. And pretty much this just gives you a little bit uh, more power, and uh, the A8 would be a faster salamander, which to me sounds pretty fun. Uh, the other thing that could be uh, put into contention or put into an idea when we talk about putting in the HE-162 uh, into the game is that it had, uh, well, uh, variable guns probably isn't the right uh, the right 
way to put it, but uh, there were ones uh, in the version of the A8 which had 20mm MG151s, and then there were others which had 30mm MK108s. So, in effect, you could have, you know, uh, if you wanted to not just have the extra engine power and you wanted a little bit more variability between the two aircraft, then what you could do is you could add one which has the 20s, uh, kind of like, I believe, the uh, premium gift one also has the 20s, the MG151s, kind of like what they did with the ME163s where uh, they changed the loadouts, and on this you could change the power behind it, uh, the HE1. 162A8, and also the guns, uh, if you wanted the feel to be different. Overall, the 162A2 isn't great in the game, uh, it doesn't fly very well and overheats very quickly, and with this aircraft, uh, it could give it a little bit of a boost, but you still have to try and uh, convince people to use it over other aircraft which are pretty good around there for the Germans. You know, the ME262 is really fun to fly, so is the Arado, uh, even all of the versions of the 262 are nice. The 163 is around there too. It, it's a hard sell for the poor 162 nowadays. The next one is uh, the, <laughs> the Electric Lightning F6. Uh, so this has been passed on and a lot of people have been talking about the F6 and uh, for good reason. It's seen as one of the next steps when it comes to uh, British design that we're going to see in the game. One of the biggest issues uh, that Britain has, uh, which I've talked about quite a lot, is if you look at their you know, supersonic aircraft, you have a large gap between the majority of their aircraft where they go from around about 0.9 to 2. The Lightning F6 is one of those ones which is sat at 2, 2.2 Mac. Uh, so, in game right now, the fastest machine we have is the Mitsubishi T2. I believe it goes around 1.6, 1.7 Mac. So the, Engl the English Electric Lightning would be a step above this. But it is the next logical step if we want Britain to get a supersonic vehicle, since it doesn't have one right now. And I'm sure uh, with Gaijin, what they're doing is they're slowly building up to the English Electric Lightning, which is wonderful, but at the end of the day, it's eventually going to have to come if, you know, Britain wants a supersonic vehicle, uh, because all of the other ones, such as the Nats, uh, such as the Scimitar, are all subsonic, uh, in, in a sense. So, with the uh, Electric Lightning F6, it was uh, born out of a testbed. Uh, <laughs> basically, the, um, the English Electric Lightning, or the Ingr English Electric P1, I should say, was just a uh, kind of a, a, a test concept which went too far, I think is the best way of putting it. So what they did in the 50s was create a concept for an interceptor which they wanted to make. The concept was seen as incredibly successful, so therefore they started building it into what we know today as the English Electric Lightning. So, the Air Force uh, needed an advanced interceptor. They had been making do with a lot of ones which would be seen as defensive uh, interceptors instead of an aggressive one. So, uh, what they did was they decided to build uh, something which was similar to it. So, uh, they had, you know, these swept wings in the back. It also had different, depending on what version you want to look at of the Lightning, it has different forms of radar on it and also access to air to air missiles. And of course, it has the the, what I like to call vertical engines. It has the two uh, exhausts on the back and it has two engines sat on top of each other that you can see here uh, in an afterburner stage uh, where in testing I believe since of course it has its stopped in position. Uh, but overall, the engines themselves, if I can just go down to the schematics, uh, were of Oh, did you not list it? Come on, that's not very fair. But basically, uh, oh, here we go. It had two Rolls-Royce Avon 301R after burning turbojets. And the reason why uh, I believe that uh, the F6 has been uh, picked here by Piv, uh, or Piev is the fact that it only goes 2.0 Mac instead of higher compared to some of the other Lightnings. The main thing to understand is that it was seen as a great success for Britain and a a lot of people are incredibly prideful of it, and I understand why. For me personally, it is part of my uh, kind of personal history in a way, since uh, when I was growing up, 
I grew up very close to a uh, training uh, academy for the Royal Air Force, and I would see a lot of lightnings around the place all the time. And uh, it, it just, I kind of grew up with it, uh, even though I wasn't part of the military, you know, I'm not from a military family, it was just seen as one of those really interesting outside things, which I could never fully get a grasp of. Uh, before we move on, I do want to just thank the people for making their stuff. So for the P6M, thank you to Walmart for the uh, HVARS Rogue Star Flyer, and then for the 162, Epic Blitzkrieg 87, and of course, PF. For the lightning so as i said once the lightning comes to game uh, i think a lot more people will be happy with the top tier british right now or if we get another hunter variant a lot of people are looking forward to that but for me i would much prefer to see this aircraft you can actually see uh, some rockets here mounted on the top of the uh, of the wing which is definitely unconventional it also had access to defers two of them in the uh, lower area of the fuselage you can see a gun pack which is uh, put here so it does have access to defers uh, which is good and of course you have a bunch of different variants because once the british get a good idea we definitely uh, tear it apart and try and uh, make sure that there are a bunch of different variants uh, you know built out of it as much as possible so when it comes to the armaments, as I said, two 30mm Aidens, incredibly powerful. We already have them in game on a lot of top tier vehicles. The G91YS comes to mind if you want to see how powerful these things are. Then it has two under fuselage for mounting air to air missiles. It has two over wing pylon stations for ferry tanks and provisions to carry combinations of missiles, the de Havilland fire streaks and the de Havilland, uh, sorry, and the Hawker Sidley red toes. So overall, it would be great to see this in go. It really would. It would be the first top tier aggressive offensive interceptor that the British have will have since the Hunter was added in game uh, before it was changed uh, at the time. So I would love to see it. Uh, I hope when it comes in, it, it has a similar situation to the Mitsubishi where it doesn't have too much competition around it so it can have fun. Uh, the next one is from Sniper NZSAS, and uh, he or she is advocating for, of course, uh, some bigger bombs. One of the things that has always confused me about War Thunder is why do we not have stuff like the Tall Boy, even the Grand Slam? And what Sniper is doing here is advocating for the £8,000 HC bomb and the £12,000 uh, HC bomb. So basically, you know, the Tall Boy. He doesn't want to go the Grand Slam uh, because we don't have anything close to it yet. But uh, the reasons why uh, he is advocating for these bombs is because we have late war heavy bombers which can drop 26,000 pounds worth of bombs, this is very true. We have fixed the bomber spawn issue, so now you can't spawn 5 year 2s and end the game and rush the enemy airfield, that's incredibly true. That was a long time ago at this point. Already in the game for 2 years, the Soviet 11,000 uh, FAB 5000 bomb at BR 4.3 is talking about the PE-8s bomb there. And the 6,600 pound FAB 3000 bomb at later tiers, which is the 3000 kilo that the Soviets get. So you can understand uh, where he's coming from. You know, the issues that these large bombs would have caused have been dealt with. And at the same time, even if you add these in, there are still bigger bomb loads available for different machines. Uh, so adding in the 8000 and the 12000 from RAF and also some of the other bombs uh, such as the 4000 pound bomb from the americans which could be carried as you can see by b24s and b17s and i'm sure that you know they could probably be carried by the b29s as well uh, the the main thing is it would be lovely to see these just for those situations uh, like you get with the pe8 and ground forces where you just hear the whistle of the large bomb and you see the lancaster above and you realize that whatever <laughs> Whatever is close to it is going to get annihilated. For me personally, before adding in these bombs, uh, I would like to see the bomb mechanics improved in War Thunder. And this is something I've talked about quite a lot in the past. Like uh, with the Japanese Navy coming to the game, one of the things that the Japanese have, they have AP bombs. And these AP bombs are just strictly worse than their counterparts in War Thunder right now because it only really matters with the bombs what your high explosive masses. So I would much more prefer a rework 
work of how bombs work and uh, their APness uh, being taken into consideration and also you know uh, the basic uh, mechanics behind them instead of how uh, you know the way they explode may be a little bit more realistic when it comes to reacting with armor so it would be lovely to see these bombs but at the same time I think uh, advocating for a more historical and realistic uh, bomb detonation uh, very similar to how rockets were updated uh, which you know we talked about with the HVARS uh, would, it would be really nice to see the next one is a fake aircraft, uh, this is the Ki-91, and uh, I say fake because it was never fully built. Uh, <laughs> and um, so, uh, what do I mean by this? This might trigger a few people, uh, I'm not bothered, I've, you know, I've made my opinions clear on machines like this. So the Kawasaki Ki-91 was another one of these ridiculous heavy bomber designs that was never going to work for the Japanese. They made a bunch of these, uh, the G8s are a great example, the G5s, and this is another one of them. The Ki-91 was supposed to be larger than the B-29, it was supposed to have 12 20 millimeters all over it, including a quad 20 millimeter turret in the back of it, and the idea was is that it would be used for long, uh, you know, long range heavy bombing, and uh, it would be uh, at a very high altitude, be able to go over 10,000 kilometers in range, and have a maximum speed of 580 kilometers an hour with turbocharged engines, uh, which were the Mitsubishi HA214 18 cylinder engines. Well, guess what? Uh, they made a wooden mock-up of it, and the uh, officers of the, at the time uh, ordered a construction of the prototype, and guess what? It was never finished. The general reports say it was about 60% done. Uh, that's not good enough for me. It wasn't flight tested or anything like that. And on top of this, uh, the reason why it was never constructed was the constant B-29 bombing rains, uh, raids were seen as destroying its construction, along with the lack of aluminium, which is a ridiculous amount uh, that they had to use to make this thing. It, it, it was completely unfeasible to make something like this at the time, but they tried it anyway. And on top of this as well, uh, a lot of the resources were going to the defensive interceptors which the uh, Japanese were making, which, you, you know, you can't blame them uh, because that, you know, they're getting pounded all day, all night by B-24s and, well, mainly B-24s and then B-29s. You've got to try and do something about it, and guess what? A Ki-91 is not that machine. So, overall, uh, it's kind of sad... Uh, well, it would kind of annoy me that this, uh, would, if it ever came to the game, but then again, it's better than the, uh, the pre-existing R2-Y2. Blueprints and pictures of the plane. Uh, yes, yes, yes. If you want to see them all, there you go. If you want to call that a blueprint or a picture, sure. But yeah, the main thing is 12 20mm cannons. You can see them all here. You've got two here, two in the undercarriage, two here, two here, and four in the booty. Like, it, it's it's fast. It's got a lot of guns on it, very similar to the G8, and it only has 4,000 kilos of bombs, uh, which could be pushed for 8,000 kilos for shorter-range missions. How do you know it was never bloody built? Anyway, let's move on. So the next one, uh, oh, that was from uh, Kuroi Atori, uh, so thank you for that. And then we have, of course, Florus uh, with the F-84F Thunderstreak. Now, the F-84s that we have in-game are all kind of similar to each other when it comes to their design. The F-84F, uh, which was uh, used by the Italian Air Force in 1956, they were given uh, some of them and they operated them until 1971. This suggestion here is for the Italians to get the F-84Fs. Uh, so just, you know, take that into account. I think it's fine uh, that if they want to do that, you know, go ahead. It, it sits in the rules of the game and all of that stuff. Uh, so... You know, it doesn't really bother me too much. But um, when it comes to the F-84F, the reason why it would be lovely to see is because it had an upgraded engine in the form of the Wright J-65, and also it had swept wings, which gave it a higher max speed and more maneuverability at high speeds. The problem with the design, though, is that it didn't deal with some of the pre-existing problems that the F-84 had, such as the fact that it really didn't like taking off. The F-84 just did not... Uh, like taking off at all. Uh, even in, you know, perfect conditions, you would need a crazy long runway. You can see the swept wings here, very different to the F-84s that we have in-game. Now, uh, 
And when it comes to the flight performance of this, I've seen it uh, written that it would be close to the flight performance of uh, some of the top tier aircraft that we have in game, such as the Canada Air Sabre and the uh, F-40 Sabre and the F-25 Sabre. I think it would be slightly worse than that, uh, but it would still be, you know, an incredibly good aircraft. Still stuck with the 50 cows, uh, 650s on this design, and then also obviously 6,000 pounds of ordnance. Overall, I'd love to see it in game just because it is something different it isn't nice seeing the same uh the same aircraft being added to every tree uh, so why not you know if we're gonna add another american aircraft to a different tree at, le at least let's make it a variation kind of like how they did with the uh you know the italian tree overall with the m26 and the m26a1 and you know the m47 and the m47 105 i think that w those were good ideas so yeah uh, it would be lovely to see this and i'm sure uh, you americans will eventually get a version too the last one is the Free French Spitfires. Now, if you don't know about the Free French, uh, there was obviously some uh, interesting time for France in World War II. Uh, after the invasion of France was over and France had capitulated, there was two uh, sides. Basically, you had the <laughs> you had the French government in exile, which uh, they went south and basically ran away, and uh, to regroup and form what is known as the Free French Forces. And then you had Vichy France. France, which was the area of France which was controlled by the Germans. It was a technically a French state, but it was under the heel of the German war machine. So, with that said, the Free French forces still fought on uh, after the armistice of uh, 9, June 1940, and they used pretty much whatever they could get their hands on. So in-game right now, we have some examples, the AG-9T, the AG-3, and on top of this, they used a bunch of different Spitfires. Uh, so the Free French pilots, they used the Spitfire Mark 1s, the Mark 2s, the Mark 5s, the B and C variants, the tropical and non-tropical, the Mark 9s, and also the Mark 16s, uh, with other stuff as well. And what uh, good old Lucky B has done here is he's actually uh, gone through the Free French squadrons that flew Spitfires and uh, has been able to, you know, uh, he's been able to identify them give uh, not camouflages but badges to them all and showing that with these camouflage markings you can make premiums out of them you could put them in the general tree uh, you could do really whatever you wanted with them and he's done a great job here of being able to lay out, uh, you know, historical pictures uh, of these Spitfires which were used by the French, and on top of this, uh, you know, as I said, the squadrons behind them, uh, showing that, you know, even though France may have capitulated, the French did fight on in areas such as North Africa. So they used all the way, as I said, up to Mark 16s, so or at least uh, from this uh, point of view. And uh, it would be nice to see them either in the tech trees or as premiums. As I said before, uh, in, in my opinion, when it comes to copy aircraft, I'm not a fan. You know, I, I don't like grinding out the American Jumbo and then the uh, French Jumbo, but if it's seen that they're required uh, to make the grind for the uh, French tree easier, I can, you know, I can understand that. But for me, I, I the best position for these aircraft, if we wanted to add them, would be as camouflages in the British tree or as premiums in the French tree. That would be uh, the best way to do it. Or even gift aircraft, you know, since, uh, since the French use so many different versions or so many... Uh, yeah, so many different variants of the Spitfire, you could easily have one which is just a gift variant for either a tournament, maybe a Spitfire anniversary, kind of like how we had last year with the uh, Spitfire tournaments, or something like that, you know, it could work uh, perfectly in that way. But anyway, uh, those are the aviation past to, consider past to developer stuff, which was passed in March of 2019. I hope you all have a wonderful day, and I'll see you next time. I'd just like to thank Nick Graham, Dyslexic Child, Be Young, and Blackie for supporting me on Patreon.